ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. This is our fireside chat with local ethics authorities. Um, and if you're not familiar with the concept of a fireside chat, it's essentially just a conversation with a group of experts in a given field or area. And so today I am going to serve as your moderator. My name is Asia Stuart Mitchell. I'm a supervisory attorney for the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability's Office of Government Ethics. I'm going to moderate and I will, before I do this, I want to check that everyone can hear me. So can you go ahead and indicate in the chat that you can hear me? And hopefully I don't have to repeat what I just said. Yes, yes, great. Great, excellent. All right, you all can hear me, that's great. And so now I am going to uh, introduce you to our esteemed panel that we're gonna hear from today during the fireside chat. First, we have Yoan Chris Amberger. He is the director of the Baltimore City Ethics Board. Born and raised in Berlin, Germany, Director Amberger attended the University of West Berlin Gottingen, and he was a German academic exchange service scholar at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He also earned a master's from St. John's College Graduate Institute in Annapolis, Maryland. After 22, a 22 year career in the financial publishing industry, he decided to go to law school at the age of 48. He graduated from the University of Baltimore School of Law in 2015. After two years in private practice, he was invited to join the state's attorney's office for Baltimore City, where he served in the police integrity unit for five years. He was designated director of the Baltimore City Ethics Board in July of 2022. He has been married for 33 years, has three adult children, and lives in Baltimore County. Thank you for joining us, Director Amberger. Next, we have Ashley Cooks, Director of Government Ethics for the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. Ashley Cooks became the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability's Director of the Office of Government Ethics on December 2nd, 2021, after serving as the Acting Director for the prior six months. Ms. Cooks began working at Vega in 2015 as an attorney advisor and has also served as a supervisory attorney advisor and as the agency's inter interim general counsel. Ms. Cooks is a member of the, the District of Columbia Bar, the Greater Washington Area Chapter of the National Bar Association, the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics, and the National Association of Black Compliance and Risk Management Professionals. Ms. Cooks graduated from the University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law, woo -woo, and Southern University A&M College, she is a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, but currently resides in Ward 5 with her family. Next, we have Stuart Pateau, the director of the Virginia Council of Conflicts of Interest and Ethics Advisory Council. Stuart Pateau became executive director of the Virginia Council of, excuse me, Virginia Conflict of Interest and Ethics Advisory Council in July of 2016. His duties include advising the council on legal issues, drafting formal advisory opinions for council review, and providing informal advice to all state and local officers, employees, and officials who are covered by Virginia's Conflicts of Interest Act, as well as lobbyists who are registered in Virginia. Previously, he worked at the Virginia State Crime Commission for 15 years, where he served as senior staff attorney from 2000 to 2003, and then as director of legal affairs from 2003 onwards. Director Pateau, received his undergraduate degree from the College of William and Mary and his law degree from the University of Virginia. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Todd Turner, Executive Director of the Prince George's County Office of Ethics and Accountability. The Honorable Todd M. Turner was appointed to serve as the second Executive Director of the Prince George's County Office of Ethics and Accountability in October, 2022. Prior to serving as executive director, Mr. Turner served eight years as a member of the Prince George's County Council. Prior to his election to County Council, Turner served as a legislative officer and attorney position for the Prince George's County Council, held the position of director of constituent services for the Prince George's County Council, um, council member Douglas J.J. Peters, and as a special assistant in the office of the former Maryland State Senate President Thomas V. Miller Jr. In addition, he served as, as a council member for the city of Bowie from 2005 to 2014, 
where he also served as mayor pro tem, pro tem excuse me, from 2007 to 2009, becoming the first African-American to hold the position in the city's history. Mr. Turner is a graduate of the City University of New York School of Law at Queens College and received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Government and Law and a minor in History from Lafayette College of Eastern Pennsylvania. He and his wife, Anita, reside in Bowie with their two daughters, Rachel and Maya, both graduates of Prince George's County Public Schools. All right. Asia, Asia um, looks like Director Amberger is still in the attendee box. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I hadn't signed him as a panelist. Let me see here. Try this again. All right. That should have worked. Director Amberger? Yes. Uh, are, you, good. are you able to turn your camera on now? Yes, I, I, I have. Hang on one second. All righty. All right. I can't see myself yet, but um, I'm here. Hmm, videos on maybe. Oh, that. Oh, good looking guy. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. No problem. All right, so thanks everybody for joining us. And so I'm gonna be your moderator today. And so I'll just jump in. I'm gonna be asking our um, esteemed panel some questions and we're gonna hear about their experience in ethics and leading um, these different ethics entities in our local area. All right, the first question, <clears throat> what an ethics office is empowered to do can have a real impact on its ability to be effective and make ethical change in government. Please describe your office's authority and structure. And uh, Director Cooks, if you could start us off. Sure, um, but first I wanna thank everyone for attending today, as well as attending our prior sessions. Uh, we've, we've had great numbers in attendance and I just wanna thank you all for supporting us. Uh, we really enjoy putting on these types of programs for you all. And we, um, we just thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, so the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability is an independent agency um, that was established in 2012. It has a five member presiding board and there are actually two offices within the agency. There's the Office of Open Government, uh, which focuses on government transparency through the administration of um, the Freedom of, of Information Act and the Open Meetings Act. Then there's my office, the Office of Government Ethics, and we serve as the district's ethics authority by administering and enforcing the Code of Conduct. So the Code of Conduct is a set of ethics rules of uh, varying re regulations and statutes that apply to district government employees' conduct. We have jurisdiction over the entire district government. That includes elected officials, independent agencies, uh, board and commission members, as well as employees. Our board actually meets on a monthly basis. We have our next board meeting uh, next Thursday. We, uh, the Office of Government Ethics, also known as OGE, has 17 full-time employees. So we're considered a smaller agency within the district government. And we engage in various activities to promote ethical conduct within the district government. Our main functions include trainings, uh, we provide trainings on all of the code of conduct topics. We provide advice to employees and public officials who contact us. Uh, we provide two forms of advice that is informal ethics advice that may be through a phone call, a, an email, or someone may stop by our office. And we also provide formal advisory opinions um, that are published on our website. We conduct ethics investigations um, that are based on complaints that we receive. Also, it may be based on something that we saw in the media or a news article. 
or a referral from another district agency. We administer the district's financial disclosure statement program, which includes the collection and audit of, of over 8,000 uh, financial disclosure statements. And lastly, we regulate lobbyist activity within the district government. So anyone who lobbies a public official must register with the Office of Government Ethics on an annual basis and submit quarterly activity reports. Regarding our penalties, um, if it is determined that an employee or public official has engaged in unethical conduct, um, the board has the authority to issue a fine of up to $5,000 per ethics violation or a public censure um, or even a period of probation. Our cases, they do take on several different avenues when it comes to penalties. So a case may result in a negotiated disposition, which is a settlement agreement between myself and the respondent. It does usually involve a fine. Um, there's also always a, um, most of the time, there's a requirement to attend training and a few other stipulations for the respondent. Um, a case can also result in a show cause hearing, which is an informal hearing before me, where the respondent has to show cause as to why they should not be fined for their ethical conduct. And there's also an, an a case can also go to an open and adversarial hearing before the board. Um, that is the equivalent to an administrative hearing where my office has the burden of proof, proving that the person has engaged in unethical conduct. Um, and then the person is there, they're able to be represented by counsel and the board makes a determination as to whether a code of conduct uh, violation has occurred. And we also have some non-public dispositions that are issued for um, rather minor ethics violations. Uh, did I miss anything in the question, Asia? I mean, I worked there in any day. It sounds like a lot when you say it. You don't realize it when you're doing it every day. <laughs> I think you captured it. Thank you, Director Cooks. Um, Director Amberger, can you go well, ahead? It's uh, very similar in the setup. We have five board members for Baltimore City uh, who are uh, appointed by it's three by the mayor, one by the city council president, um, and uh, one by the controller. Uh, we meet uh, once a month as well on every second Wednesday of the month. Um, our ethics staff, we're only three, including myself, uh, an ethics officer and an assistant, and have been um, pretty much, uh, our ethics law you know, has to resemble that of the state of Maryland. So our um, areas are as well, the financial disclosures for about 3,000 Baltimore City employees, uh, lobbyist registration, um, the uh, gift waiver um, petitions and, uh, and sec secondary employment um, petitions. Um, our um, power to penalize is not quite as extensive. Um, of course, the first step for us is to approach someone who once a uh, prima facie violation of an ethics provision has been found, um, we approach the, um, the person who has been uh, found in violation of the law and give the opportunity to cure. And out of that um, uh, evolves, you know, if it, usually it, it remains at that point and it can go uh, further into uh, hearings and you know, hearings can be, results of the hearing can be contested. So uh, we, we, we're not quite as powerful. Um, our, our focus is primarily, I would say, on compliance and conflict avoidance. So um, and once we are you know, focused on compliance, um, we become um, the assistance, so to say, of our clients, we, of, and who are the, the Baltimore City employees. So we, we are trying to help them avoid conflicts from the get-go, and we help them to comply with all the um, uh, reporting requirements. Thank you, Director Amberger. Director Patel? 
Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Um, I think perhaps uh, the reason I was invited is because uh, my agency is a little bit different from the others in that we have absolutely no enforcement power. Um, the We call ourselves the Ethics Council. We were fairly new. We were created in 2015, and we were specifically put in the legislative branch of government, and we are specifically, and we tell people this at our trainings, do a lot of trainings, uh, we don't have any enforcement power. We do not have any investigatory power. Um, one other thing that may be different from some of our uh, sister or fellow organizations throughout the country and for the panelists, we don't do anything with campaign finance. We do not do anything with freedom of information. We simply do uh, conflicts guidance, having a contract with the company that also has a contract with your own agency. Uh, we are responsible for lobbyist registrations, lobbyist disclosure reports that they must do at, at least at the end of the year for their lobbying year. We create the forms for financial disclosures for those state and local officers and employees that are required to file. We administer an online filing system for state officers and employees and locally elected constitutional officers. All other local elected officials do not use our online filing system. They file directly. It's our form, but they file it with their local clerks. Uh, we always tell people we are here to help you. You can never get in trouble coming to us for guidance. Um, and so we are a resource, which is, I think is very helpful. We may not be able to do much enforcement, but hopefully we get people to come to us and ask questions so we can let them know you, you can do this or you cannot do this. Um, technically, the board itself is made up of nine people, uh, uh, two active members from each uh, chamber, the House of Delegates and the Senate of Virginia. Uh, then there are two retired judges, each appointed by a separate chamber, and then the governor appoints three people, uh, um, some qualifications for that. So there are nine. However, our board typically only meets about once a year. Uh, we're required to by statute. They can meet more frequently if there's some kind of an urgent or crisis, but typically it's just my staff, a group of four, myself, one other attorney, and then two people who handle all of the electronic filing processes and help agencies when it comes to the filing of disclosure forms and the filing of lobbyists, registrations and disclosures. So that is what we do. Thank you so much, Director Patel, Executive Director Turner. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. I first want to say I want to thank uh, Bega for the opportunity to uh, put this panel together and have this roundtable of discussion. I, I think it's very important uh, that we uh, all work cooperatively here in the, the Washington uh, region, uh, the DMV, as we call it. Uh, and so uh, as a new member of, of the uh, responsible organizations here or represented it, I, I know it's an opportunity for me to, to listen, learn as well. Um, obviously, uh, I'm the uh, new executive director for the Office of Ethics and Accountability. Uh, as was mentioned by Mr. Amberger, uh, the state of Maryland requires all 24 jurisdictions and all municipal governments and town governments uh, to have ethics codes uh, somewhat similar to state law. Um, obviously, in Prince George's County, we've, we've had a board of ethics probably since the late uh, 70s, early 80s, as required by state law. Our office, the Office of Ethics and Accountability, was created in 2012, similarly, same time frame as uh, Vega, um, by former County Executive Richard Baker. And we, in addition to our traditional uh, responsibilities under the Ethics Code, we're somewhat almost like a, a mini Inspector General as well. So in addition to the code requirements related to conflicts of interest, uh, lobbying disclosure, financial disclosure statements, um, we also have a responsibility for fraud, waste, abuse, and legal acts involving county employees, county services. Um, and we only have responsibility for county services. There are uh, several other uh, entities that uh, reside in Prince George's County, whether they are state created, such as the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission or WSSC. Uh, they have their own separate requirements under state law uh, to have a code of ethics. Uh, same thing now with the uh, Board of Education. Um, and in addition, obviously, legislation over the last couple of years related to police accountability, there's a, a separate inspector general in Prince George's County for those. So uh, again, we are focused primarily on uh, county government services employees, uh, making sure they comply with the code of ethics. Uh, we have a staff of six uh, in our office. And we do have a five member board. I know, I think our board chair, as well as some members have uh, joined us uh, this morning. 
Um, and uh, obviously we meet monthly um, uh, for the most part, except during the summer and, and during December. Um, so um, our, our, very, our cases are very similar to those that you've already heard about. Uh, obviously we do do informal advice, formal advice as well. Uh, we do lobbying registration, in which they are required not only to register if they're lobbying, but also do an annual report, which we review. Uh, we, consistent with state law, we have to certify each year with the state ethics commission that uh, our county code uh, is uh, consistent with what state law requires as well. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to, to hear the discussion uh, this morning. Thank you, Executive Director Turner. Um, I, I think we have a really good cross section of um, the, the kinds of ethics entities that exist um, and in this country anyway. Um, we, some of us have certain functions, some of us don't, but it seems like at the core, we all serve that same function, which is to educate people on ethics and try to prevent um, ethics violations and conflicts of interest. So I'm excited. Um, I've said this earlier in the week, but I am an ethics nerd and I'm very excited about this panel. Um, so thank you all for being on again. And I will go to the second question. What are some of your office's most successful programs and initiatives? And what are some of the lessons you've learned during the launch or implementation of these programs and initiatives? And can we'll start with Executive Director Turner since you went last last time. Thank you. You know, having a T name, I'm usually last going on the, in, in life, but uh, appreciate the opportunity to go first. Um, obviously, one of the things that we're focused on is uh, obviously training and education. Um, I call my team the ACE team, um, A standing for uh, providing advice uh, to tell you to what to do or not to do uh, under the code. Uh, obviously, if you uh, don't do it correctly, we go to the C, which is the compliance part. Uh, and then obviously the last part is if you really uh, make a mistake or, or do something wrong is the E, which is the enforcement. So my, my goal is if we do A and C correctly, we never get to E. Uh, that's, that's our goal of our office. Um, so education is obviously part of that, getting to folks when they first come on as county employees, and we provide regular training updates. So in addition to our almost 6,000 uh, county employees, we probably have close to 40 or maybe 50 boards and commissions that are also required uh, to file and be subject to the code of ethics as well. So we, and obviously these are citizen-based persons who are volunteering their time. Uh, and so we provide training to them to make sure there aren't any particular conflicts in their service in that capacity. The other thing that we do is we do a monthly reminder uh, to our county employees on a different subject matter each month. Uh, so traditionally February would be on what you can do and accept as far as gifts, you know, for Valentine's Day. Um, in addition, uh, you know, we might do earlier this year, uh, because of the ongoing political activity involving uh, uh, one of our elected officials, uh, we did a uh, countywide political activity training um, it was online, but for all 6,000 employees to, to engage in that, just to refresh them about what they can and can't do uh, as, as employees, and particularly on county time. Um, the other thing that has been a focus of mine, uh, given my, my, my background, is um, since we do have responsibility for fraud, waste, abuse, and illegal acts, uh, is doing more community outreach um, to our residents. Um, our focus has been primarily internal in county government uh, in that way, but uh, let's be honest, if that stuff is occurring, it's occurring with our residents, and they need to know that we are available uh, to make those type of complaints. So uh, I think we're continuing to do that, uh, getting out uh, for the first time, I think we did a brochure explaining what the Board of Ethics is and what the Office of Ethics and Accountability is and getting out there and meeting with people so they understand that we are available for them to assist them. Thanks, Executive Director Turner. Um, Director Patel, do you want to answer this one? Yes, um, like a lot of, uh, for my agency in particular, what am I most proud of or what have been the most successful uh, things? One, of course, was our educational component of which I'm very proud and I can brag about it because it was a online thing that was created and I had no skills, this was my wonderful staff. But when we started, like I think a lot of um, online training things, it was very 
boring. It was basically just a PowerPoint and a voice, my voice droning on for, you know, 50 minutes. Um, we decided that this was not useful. Um, we want to have something that really allows officers and employees who take the training, they've learned something and they are engaged. So we did, I think, an excellent job with our online training system. And that's something I'm very proud of. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback about it. This other thing that I think we were uh, very good is we were a fairly new organization. And when I became the director, I'm the second director, um, I really stress that a lot of what our job functions entail is not just one on one individuals with people throughout the Commonwealth, but we also have to have working relationships with many, many, many agencies, every local school board, every locality, board of supervisors, all the state agencies. We interact with them on an agency to agency uh, basis as well. And I really wanted to stress for my staff, and it's done a great job, we need to build good working relationships with all the agencies that we work with. Um, if we don't have good relations, uh, it's going to be very difficult to effectively do our job, which is encouraging compliance with COIA and avoiding COIA errors. So I've really stressed to my staff, tell them, tell, we work with all the agencies, we're here to help you. And over time, it really has, I think, worked. Um, when we started off, there was like the suspicion, um, are we coming to take away people's power? Are we trying to build an empire? And we really stressed, no, no, none of, none of that at all. We're here to help you. And fostering those good relationships has just been something we've been, I think, successful at, and it's integral to us doing a good job from our position. Thanks so much, Director Patel. Um, I know firsthand the importance of um, having engaging training materials. So that's no small feat. Um, so congratulations on that. Uh, Director Amberger? Well, it's uh, very similar to my predecessors. Um, I, I think we uh, had a very good success, number one, having our uh, ethics training on video on our website, uh, very nicely uh, made uh, videos, um, also uh, supervised and voiced by my predecessor. Um, we also were able to integrate our ethics training into Workday which is our uh, administrative uh, main software. So um, we not only have the uh, you know, drumbeat of uh, emails for people who are tardy on their, on their ethics training, but we also have the automatic notifications um, yeah, in Workday. And uh, I think the, the, one, of the, one of the best um, aspects of uh, our uh, ethics staff has been that we have become, or my staff has become uh, visible, not necessarily to the press, to the public, but to our uh, constituents, so to say, to our employees who know that they can call uh, either our ethics officer or myself at any time. Um, if there's a question, we encourage questions, we encourage um, you know, any kind of contact to, to create that uh, mechanism in people's minds that, you know, they come, they come to a situation. And then it's, it's not the training, but it's, you know, it is kind of having to deal with ethics that the switch is uh, going off in their heads and saying, oh, maybe I should run that by ethics if that is, is uh, compliant with the code. And I think that is probably the most uh, gratifying uh, aspect uh, here that we we are not. I hope we're not feared, but we're we're um, considered hopefully a um, a collaborator on on the way to better governance. Thanks so much, Director Amberger. Director Cooks. So this is actually um, a tough question for me because it's hard to pick the most successful, right? When you have it's so many great. successful programs. We do so okay. much great work. <laughs> and I know folks are on here listening, but uh, anyway, yeah, it is, it's very hard to pick the most successful because um, each program in my office has had success in its own right. So the FDS program just, just finished a successful filing season where we initiated um, having confidential filers to file using the e-filing system, the same e-filing system that the public filers use. 
so that we could have all the forms in one central location. And that was very successful. Uh, the lobbyist program, they just finished some upgrades, which make um, filing registrations and paying registration fees more easy for lobbyists and their clients. And then, of course, the investigations division, they've adopted some internal policies to make their investigative processes run smoothly. Um, but if I have to pick just one, I think I have to follow my colleagues and talk about training, um, specifically our learning management system that was launched in April 2022. So it's the first of its kind for my office. Um, it's a online on demand training system that employees and public officials can access anytime. And um, users are able to go on there. They're, they're able to go to our website, access the link, self register, and then take any course that we have in our course catalog. So it's important, I, it's, we think in my office that it's important that we highlight training as much as possible especially since we have such um, heavy enforcement authority, we would much rather train employees and you know, get them knowledgeable about the ethics rules than have to conduct an investigation on them. Um, but the LMS, I would say, has been the most successful so far. Um, it's an area that was missing from our training program. Um, it, really showed, it really showed up during the pandemic because everything in person was no more. We were online, we were virtual, we, could, we were conducting our trainings via WebEx, um, but we needed to reach more people and provide them with the information that they needed. Um, and because we are such a small agency, and again, we have jurisdiction over 37,000 employees, we needed a way to do that. So we um, decided to purchase a learning management system. And even before the launch, it was, um, it was a lot of work. So it was, it took months of market research uh, with the help of the Office of Contracting and Procurement. And then it took months to develop the actual content because um, as a government agency, our rules are different. Um, they're unique from the private sector and even some other states or city jurisdictions. So we had to actually create content that fit our rules. And that took, that was a heavy lift for the staff. And I still thank them to this day for their dedication, because not only did they draft the actual courses, they actually did audio. They did the voiceovers for a lot of the courses on the LMS. So it was not an easy task. Um, also, I'd like to say about the LMS that it, it made us realize how much was missing from the current trainings that we had. So we've always had good trainings and we provided trainings to um, folks on basically every, every area of the code of conduct, but it made us realize that we were actually not hitting home to folks. We were talking in a lot of legal ease because we're all attorneys and we needed to reach those employees who are not, um, they're not looking at the ethics rules every day. They don't talk to an ethics counselor every day or you know, they're, they're out in the field, they're doing work that's not necessarily in the office setting. So it made, it, it made us realize how much we were missing from our content um, so that we updated that. Um, also, it made us actually <laughs> sit down and think about how we could reach these employees um, and actually give them rules that just weren't so heavily laded in legalese that it was something that everyone could relate to in everyday terms. So um, it was it was definitely a process to create the LMS. So far, we've gotten great feedback. Um, about the content of the system, about how user friendly it is. Um, and from a perspective of the staff, the internal staff here at Vega, it's been um, beneficial to us because we don't have to conduct as many trainings as we used to. Um, we can focus that time on writing advisory opinions, giving informal advice and other initiatives within the office. And again, it's been um, very beneficial to district employees because Employees, again, we're rather, we would rather give them the training on the front end than do an investigation on the back end. So I would say the LMS has been most successful um, as of recent. 
Thank you, Dr. Cooks. And one other thing I will add about the LMS, the benefit is it's on demand. You can do it anytime. I don't know, some people might be weird like me. You wake up in the middle of the night thinking about work and you go do a couple clicks or something on the laptop. But whenever you want to do it or you need to do it, you can do it. And it addressed um, an issue that we had before is we had put our ethics training on PeopleSoft. And that is our um, administrative uh, portal where we submit our time and all that stuff and we get notifications about required trainings. We put it there, but we then realized that um, we had special government employees like board members, commission members who don't have the people saw. And so then we were always tasked with giving them um, a, a live training. And so this addressed that issue. And so now anyone, board members, commission members, anybody can go on our learning management system and take a training at any time. If you're in a pinch, we require that you have training. Um, we ask you if you had ethics training on your financial disclosure statement, we ask you to certify that you've had training in the last year. And so if you go to do your financial disclosure, you say, rats, I didn't do my, my ethics training. You can pause on your form and go right on the LMS and complete an ethics training. Um, whereas before you may, we only have, you know, monthly trainings. And so you either had to log on to people's offer, try to catch one of our monthly trainings to be able to certify. So just wanted to add that in there. I am not on the panel, but I just wanted to add that part. <laughs> totally fine. I know that, again, Asia was one of the authors. So we're very proud of, of the system. Yeah, it's a good system. And I'm, I apologize in advance for my voice if anybody goes on and uses it. It takes a training. Um, all right. Just a, so, just an update. So we, we did the same thing in Prince George's County recently because- Oh, okay. Because our board and commission members were not part of the county system and therefore did not have access to it. So I want to thank my staff. Uh, they went through the process working with the OIT and, uh, and the executive branch to make sure that, um, you know, these board and commission members have the same opportunity. We have a same similar type of system uh, through NeoGov here in Prince George's County, same uh, learning information system. So now they have access to that. Uh, so they have that available, not only for the ethics side, but any other county trainings that they would want as well. That's excellent. So your your staff, they know my pain. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot. So we're, we're happy to finally have Director it. Director Turner, do, is there a mandatory ethics, annual ethics training requirement in PG yeah, County? Yes, there is. Actually, we just had a meeting uh, uh, earlier this week with our Office of Human Relations Management going over what will be the mandatory training, what type you know, we don't want, uh, and I'll be curious to see your system and, and how you've done it. Um, you probably have to update ours a little bit. Same same with my other colleagues uh, in, in Baltimore and Virginia. Um, now that we have the, the system, you know, what is the content to make it, you know, manageable and understandable for our employees and in different circumstances. So uh, I think that's something we'll be looking at. And so again, just like this ethics week is something that we may Maybe not start with a week, but start with a day, something uh, that we can can utilize uh, in order to improve the training and education that we do as well. Absolutely. We can we can actually set it up for you to go in and take a look at our system so we can do that afterwards. It, it won't be uh, in the middle of the night that I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I'm, I'm weird. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night. I can't go back to sleep until I've done something. I don't know why that is. I have to complete one task. Um, all right, so next question, what are some of the most significant challenges for your office and how have you addressed those challenges? And we can start with Director Amberger. Well, I think at this point, it is mostly the um, digital side. Uh, we are in the process of having our website uh, redesigned. The website originally was pretty much established as a placeholder and you know, problems were fixed with patches. And, uh, you know, at some point uh, it has to be uh, replaced and we're right in the process of doing so. And hopefully we'll uh, get a top of the line, um, uh, you know, top interactivity uh, website that will make it much easier to file the annual financial disclosures or for lobbyists to to register or you know maybe even pay online. Um, so that is that is probably the the biggest challenge we've had uh, in the last couple of months, um, and hopefully we we won't have that challenge much longer. 
Thank you, Director Amberger. Director Cooks. Um, some of, well, some of the challenges, of course, um, I'm sure my colleagues can agree is funding is always a challenge. <laughs> so we're an independent agency, but we do not have um, independent funding. So funding is always an issue um, and mainly for, for Bega because we were created, well, we were created, uh, we were created as a smaller agency. So we had around maybe 10 or so FTEs at that time. Um, since then, of course, the staff has grown, but um, there's still, I would say we still don't have sufficient staff to actually um, uh, conduct our statutory obligations and statutory mission. Um, and again, I, I, you know, I can't stress it enough of our broad jurisdiction with such a small agency. Um, and what that leads to is the current staff actually taking on more responsibilities or, you know, us finding other ways to try to meet our statutory obligations. But funding is always an issue. Um, another issue is um, finding unique and creative ways to deliver our ethics message to folks. Um, we are aware that ethics is not always the hottest topic. And at least until something happens, right? When something happens, then, oh, I can't believe that he or she did that. Then ethics becomes interesting. So we want to make ethics um, interesting all the time. We want to have employees put ethics at the forefront of their decisions, at the forefront of um, their, their conversations and things like that. So we're always um, challenged in finding ways to make that to deliver that message and deliver it in a more interesting way. So um, the LMS is one way that we've, we've um, tackled that issue. We've also had the creation of videos. We have a series of Miss Ethics videos that we use to try to make light and humor of ethics topics and ethics rules, but that's something that we struggle with internally to find out different ways to reach employees. Thank you, Director Goods. My next question is, um, in our work as government ethics professionals, we see a wide range of ethical issues. What are the most pressing ethics issues facing local governments today and what solutions might address those issues? Executive Director Turner. Uh, thank you for that question. I, you know, I, I'm, I think about this more in a holistic kind of way. I think one of the issues that we're probably all facing, not only in the ethics reign, but just in, in government in general, is kind of building that trust in government again, um, not only through our employees and officials, uh, but also particularly with our public. Um, so that's kind of you know, always on the background of my mind in, in the work that we do in our office is to, to, to kind of build that trust back in government. Um, and that's not solely our responsibility, but I think obviously it all depends on what kind of culture, not only within your office, but also within your government that you want to have. Um, some of the things that, you know, in this past year or so that I've been the executive director, um, I've seen two kinds of things. One, obviously, uh, using the ethics system as kind of retaliation against somebody or something that you, you don't like and how how for us to be responsible, given our statutory responsibility to, to investigate, but also not to get caught up in something that's not necessarily an ethics related issue. Um, the other one that we're starting to see, and it might be more a generational thing, is people challenging, <laughs> whether challenging a little bit or questioning whether or not um, the, the importance of ethics. Um, and again, that goes back to your training and education, but ultimately that, that's a decision as you as, a, as an individual, individual about how you want to interact as a public servant. Um, I, I did a recent training for municipal officials in the last couple of weeks. And my first question I asked everybody was, okay, raise your hand if you got into public service to be unethical. Of course, nobody raised their hand, but you know, so we're all, we're all here to serve, you know, our communities, uh, serve our governments to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And so 
that you know that again trust that questioning of why things are being done um why we're doing an investigation why why the investigation came to us um so those are the kind of things that you know I, I've, I've seen over the course of my short period of time and i'm not, i'm just curious if, if others are seeing that as as well Anybody have anything to add to that one? Um, I'll comment that I, I see that as well. Um, a lot of times people will come to Virginia's Ethics Council and we can tell in the background, this is purely political infighting on an issue, um, but we never get involved because when we get these complaints, we simply say, which is true, we have no statutory authority. We don't do investigations. If you think a law has been broken, contact your local police or the, the Virginia State Police. But, oh yeah, we see this quite a bit at the local level where board members, uh, board supervisor members or uh, city council people are clearly um, having a feud about something and they think they can use an ethics complaint uh, to gain leverage or score points. So yeah, that's that's an issue that we do see as well in Virginia. Yeah, I, I would say we have something similar in Baltimore too. Um, our situation is that we are attached to the uh, Inspector General's office, but we are not part of it. We can rely on some of their special agents for our own investigations if needed. But um, our um, jurisdiction is actually very narrow, and uh, a lot of what uh, you guys would have to address, you know, Inspector General issues, uh, um, waste, fraud, and so on, simply are not uh, in our jurisdiction. So we also see see the the retaliatory uh, uh, attempts that are that can be made or you know attempts to to um, engage the local media in that process you know, uh, be that by uh, publishing a complaint uh, to local media outlets and uh, which always puts us into a an odd situation because you know, it is, has become public knowledge that the, the complaint has been filed, but we are still under the obligation to keep uh, the, the very existence of that complaint confidential. Um, so, yeah, yes, I, th I probably would think about half of the complaints we're getting or have been getting over the last two years since I've been here um, are either completely out of our jurisdiction or have very strong uh, retaliatory or perhaps political um, uh, backgrounds uh, in their motivation. And Thank I can you. agree. We've, we've had those issues here in the district as well, um, especially when it comes to um, an, an employee who has been terminated and they believe that they've been terminated because um, of an ethics issue, because they reported an employee doing some type of misconduct um, to a supervisor or um, because they've seen something and they reported it that they believe they're, they've been, they were terminated because of that. Um, and we get those types of complaints, um, but our rules are so specific as that state that the employee has to report an ethics violation to us or the Office of the Inspector General. Um, and then, you know, they are protected under this retaliation statute that no one can terminate them or take action against them for reporting that ethics violation. But sometimes it's the employee reporting things that are personnel related that don't actually have anything to do with ethics. And we get that type of complaint um, that they were terminated for that action. Thank you, Dr. Cooks. All right, so my next question um, I think of all the questions, I'm really excited to hear the responses to this one. I consider it to be juicy and I apologize. Again, I'm an ethics nerd, but the question is, do government ethics programs really work? And we can start with Director Patel. I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that I'm of some use to uh, the citizenry and officials and employees throughout the Commonwealth. Yeah, I think so, because a lot of times um, uh, what we observe um, 
there are going to be some people who are just they're going to be crooks. They're going to be corrupt. And regardless of the existence of any training program or council or uh, confidential hotline, it made no difference. They decided one day they were going to try to embezzle a million dollars from the locality. That's nothing could be done. I mean, they already made the thing. But we also see a lot of situations where people will inadvertently have a problem breaking COIA, the Conflict of Interest Act, unintentionally. They weren't thinking about it. My locality really does need to get a new vendor for a product. And, oh, um, you know, my brother-in-law's company is in the area. They do the best job, best ratings. Let's hire them. And it's not until they've gotten farther down the road, you start to realize, oops, we have a situation. I'm now going to have a personal interest in a contract with a company with my own locality. I didn't mean to do this. It was a you know honest mistake. And when we do the trainings, both online and in person, we stress things like this precisely so that it won't be an issue or uh, we can make sure that perhaps the contract will be permissible, but you're gonna have to make sure at the very beginning of the process, you, the official who had the uh, personal interest, you, you were involved, you publicly removed yourself and my, my agency or and and my locality is getting work. My age and my locality, the other board members, other board officers. And so I think when we can educate people to stop them from having the inadvertent, that does good for everybody. It's good for the citizens of Virginia because they're reassured that their officials are not, you know, lining their own pockets with government money. And it's good for the officers themselves who I don't think really want to break the law. If they had known, they wouldn't have actually started going down the wrong path. So I think we do provide good use simply because we can get officials and employees to recognize this may be problematic. And then we always say, contact us. We'll give you further guidance on this particular issue. So, yeah, I think we do provide useful service for the citizenry and officers and employees of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, Director. I think uh, any uh, success of an, uh, any ethics code or ethics law you know, depends on what the law is, how complete it is, and what it covers and what it doesn't cover. So um, in our case, we, you know, it, we're in a very odd situation uh, in, in many aspects. Um, once, uh, one is, for example, the word ethics um, in our ethics law has no definition. Um, and that, that creates a kind of a, a split uh, in perception, especially in the public, where ethics has a different meaning than it has for us, for the ethics board, and especially for, for me as a lawyer working with that law and, and my staff working with the, with the law. Um, you know, ethics are, if, if I were to ask our participants here, um, you know, what, what ethics are or what ethics is, you know, if I ask 10 people, I probably get 12 different definitions of it. And, you know, we get into a very dangerous area um, that is very close to the First Amendment because, you know, we have an ethics code, an internal one, it may be religious, it may be philosophical, you know, which, what, what is ethical uh, uh, conduct? Uh, and the word ethical also is not <laughs> defined in, in our law, and neither it is, I believe, in the Maryland uh, uh, public ethics law. Um, so, in, in um, lacking that definition, lacking that broader uh, uh, jurisdiction to pursue fraud, to pursue waste or uh, um, you know, other uh, more nefarious uh, conducts, we're looking at our ethics law. Really what we can do is look at, look at it as, look at the, the term ethics meaning in compliance with our law. And you know that is mainly, as I have mentioned before, um, focused on reporting and registrations. Um, so it, it uh, really uh, depends on our legislators, um, what they put into the law to give us the tool, uh, the tools to address specific situations and you know, maybe expand the, the range of punitive measures if appropriate. 
but I think any, um, oddly enough, any ethics law is only as good as the politicians who formulate it. And uh, so that uh, maybe that is a productive angle to pursue. Thank you, Director Amberger. Um, Executive Director Turner, did you want to answer this one? Do ethics programs really work? I think on the whole they do. Uh, again, it goes back to how serious and what kind of culture you want to develop uh, by having a program. Um, and it's not only, obviously, we're talking about governmental programs, but obviously in other contexts, as Mr. Amberger said, you know, uh, in business, in not for profit, they all have their kind of code of ethics about how they should operate. And so I think you, you need those to be, uh, particularly on the governmental side, you, you need those to be able to make sure, again, the, the, the people that we are serving, which is the public and obviously our employees, understand that and try to, you know, uphold that in their interactions and the work that they do. I, I, I agree with Mr. Pateau, if somebody's going to be a criminal, they're going to be a criminal, no matter what kind of program you have. So you can't judge an ethics program on, on that. Um, however, you can in those situations where you avoid that, that conflict, that you give somebody advice. Um, as I said, you know, if we do the A and the C right, you know, we never have to get to the enforcement part, hopefully. Um, so. Yes, I, I think they're, they are required. I know we had a, a question, I don't know what we were gonna get to about you know uh, the Supreme Court and all that stuff. Uh, I, you know, My personal opinion, not on behalf of my board or my county government is yes, you should have a, a program you know, at that level in addition to you know, what we have locally, what you have at the federal level, at the local level. Uh, that's again, establishing what kind of culture you want in your particular institution. Thank you, Executive Director Turner. And yes, we are, we're coming up on time, so we didn't get to all the questions, and I, I anticipated that, and that's unfortunate. Um, but we'll just hear from Director yeah. Cooks on, th on this question. And yeah, yeah and we'll quick. I'll be real quick. quick. Go ahead. I'll be really, really quick. Um, I'll just say that the district government is a prime example of that ethics programs really do work, because at the time that Bega was created, there was a lot of corruption within the district government. Um, there were a few elected officials who had gotten into some trouble. I think two or three council members who were actually arrested for ethics related um, criminal, ethics and criminal matters that they had engaged in. So I think, um, yes, ethics programs do matter. That number of, that amount of corruption has gone down. Um, I don't, I, I won't say it's to zero because it'll never be at zero. But um, yes, having an agency that educates people on the ethics rules and holds them accountable is very beneficial for a government. And that's what Bega does. Thank you, Director Cooks. And I think we're up one time. We didn't get to finish our questions. That's okay. I think our discussion here today was great. Um, I wanna thank the attendees for being on. Um, and I want to thank my panelists here. I appreciate it. I appreciate you responding to my cold email, who was a stranger contacting me and for being, you know, dedicating your time. We had a little rehearsal and responding to me. So I just appreciate it. And um, I thank you for your time. And if anybody has any questions, you can contact us at bega at dc.gov. We appreciate you all being on and we will end with that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.